special report. President Biden addresses the nation. Reporting tonight from Tel Aviv, here's Lester Holt. Good evening from Tel Aviv. We are coming on the air because just moments from now, President Biden will address the nation from the Oval Office. This is only the president's second Oval Office address, and it comes during a pivotal point in history as a war erupts here in the Middle East between Israel and Hamas, and as Russia continues its brutal war against Ukraine. The president is expected to address both conflicts tonight and America's role in them. Mr. Biden returned from Tel Aviv just this morning. While here, he met with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, offering America's ironclad support against the Hamas terrorists who attacked Israel less than two weeks ago, killing at least 1,400. At least 31 U.S. citizens are among those killed in Israel, and 13 others are missing and feared kidnapped. Israel has responded with airstrikes that have leveled buildings and killed nearly 4,000 in Gaza, where Hamas launched its attacks from. Israel's leaders are now promising a ground war there. Tonight, the president is expected to ask Congress for $100 billion in aid for both Israel and Ukraine. The president now about to speak again from the Oval Office. Support in Congress, we should note, for Israel is more widespread than support for Ukraine. Good evening, my fellow Americans. We're facing an inflection point in history, one of those moments where the decisions we make today are going to determine the future for decades to come. That's what I'd like to talk with you about tonight. You know, earlier this morning, I returned from Israel. <clears throat> they tell me I'm the first American president to travel there during the war. I met with the prime minister and members of his cabinet. And most movingly, I met with Israelis who had personally lived through horrific horror of the attack by Hamas on the 7th of October. More than 1,300 people slaughtered in Israel, including at least 32 American citizens. Scores of innocents, from infants to the elderly grandparents, Israelis, Americans taken hostage. And as I told the families of Americans being held captive by Hamas, we're pursuing every avenue to bring their loved ones home. As president, there is no higher priority for me than the safety of American held hostage. The terrorist group Hamas unleashed pure, unadulterated evil in the world. But sadly, the Jewish people know perhaps better than anyone that there is no limit to the depravity of people when they want to inflict pain on others. <clears throat> in Israel, I saw people who are strong, determined, resilient, and also angry, in shock and in deep, deep pain. I also spoke with President Abbas, the Palestinian Authority, and reiterated the United States remains committed to the Palestinian people's right to dignity and to self-determination. The actions of Hamas terrorists don't take that right away. Like so many other, I'm heartbroken by the tragic loss of Palestinian life, including the explosion at the hospital in Gaza, which was not done by the Israelis. We mourn every innocent life lost. We can't ignore the humanity of innocent Palestinians who only want to live in peace and have an opportunity. You know, the assault on Israel echoes nearly 20 months of war, tragedy, and brutality inflicted on the people of Ukraine, people that were very badly hurt since Putin launched his all-out invasion. We've not forgotten the mass graves, the bodies found bearing signs of torture, rape used as a weapon by the Russians and thousands and thousands of Ukrainian children forcibly taken into Russia, stolen from their parents. It's sick. Hamas and Putin represent different threats, but they share this in common. They both want to completely annihilate a neighboring democracy, completely annihilate it. Hamas, to a state of purpose for existing, is the destruction of the state of Israel and the murder of Jewish people. Hamas does not represent the Palestinian people. Hamas uses Palestinian civilians as human shields, and innocent Palestinian families are suffering greatly because of that. Meanwhile, Putin denies Ukraine has or ever had real statehood. He claims the Soviet Union created Ukraine. And just two weeks ago, he told the world that if the United States and our allies withdraw, and if the United States withdraw, our allies will as well, the military support for Ukraine would have, quote, a week left to live, but we're not withdrawing. I know these conflicts can seem far away, and it's natural to ask, why does this matter to America? So let me share with you 
why making sure Israel and Ukraine succeed is vital for America's national security. You know, history has taught us that when terrorists don't pay a price for their terror, when dictators don't pay a price for their aggression, they cause more chaos and death and more destruction. They keep going. And the cost and the threats to America and the world keep rising. So if we don't stop Putin's appetite for power and control of Ukraine, he won't limit himself just to Ukraine. He's, Putin's already threatened to remind, quote, remind Poland that their Western land was a gift from Russia. One of his top advisors, a former president of Russia, has called Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania Russia's Baltic provinces. These are all NATO allies. For 75 years, NATO has kept peace in Europe and has been the cornerstone of American security. And if Putin attacks a NATO ally, we will defend every inch of NATO which a which treaty requires and calls for. We'll have something that we do not seek. Make it clear, we do not seek. We do not seek to have American troops fighting in Russia or fighting against Russia. Beyond Europe, we know that our allies and maybe most importantly our adversaries and competitors are watching. They're watching our response in Ukraine as well. And if we walk away and let Putin erase Ukraine's independence, would-be aggressors around the world be emboldened to try the same? The risk of conflict and chaos could spread in other parts of the world, in the Indo-Pacific, in the Middle East, especially in the Middle East. Iran is, is, is supporting Russia in Ukraine, and is supporting Hamas and other terrorist groups in the region, and will continue to hold them accountable, I might add. The United States and our partners across the region are working to build a better future for the Middle East, one where the Middle East is more stable, better connected to its neighbors, and through innovative projects like the India Middle East and Europe Rail Corridor that I announced this year at the summit of the world's biggest economies. More predictable markets, more employment, less rage, less grievances, less war when connected. It benefits the people who would benefit the people of the Middle East and would benefit us. American leadership is what holds the world together. American alliances are what keep us, America, safe. American values are what make us a partner that other nations want to work with. To put all that at risk, if we walk away from Ukraine, if we turn our backs on Israel, it's just not worth it. That's why tomorrow I'm going to send to Congress an urgent budget request to fund America's national security needs, to support our critical partners, including Israel and Ukraine, is a smart investment that's going to pay dividends for American security for generations. Help us keep American troops out of harm's way. Help us build a world that is safer, more peaceful, more prosperous for our children and grandchildren. In Israel, we must make sure that they have what they need to protect their people today and always. The security package I'm sending to Congress and asking Congress to do is an unprecedented commitment to Israel's security that will sharpen Israel's qualitative military edge, which we've committed to the qualitative military edge. We're going to make sure Iron Dome continues to guard the skies over Israel. We're going to make sure other hostile actors in the region know that Israel is stronger than ever and prevent this conflict from spreading. Look, at the same time, President Netanyahu and I discussed again yesterday the critical need for Israel to operate by the laws of war. That means protecting civilians in combat as best as they can. And the people of Gaza urgently need food, water, and medicine. Yesterday, in discussions with the leaders of Israel and Egypt, I secured an agreement for the first shipment of humanitarian assistance from the United Nations to Palestinian civilians in Gaza. If Hamas does not divert or steal this shipment, these shipments, we're going to provide an opening for sustained delivery of life-saving humanitarian assistance for the Palestinians. As I said in Israel, as hard as it is, we cannot give up on peace. We cannot give up on a two-state solution. Israel and Palestinians equally deserve to live in safety, dignity, and peace. You know, and here at home, we have to be honest with ourselves. In recent years, too much hate has given too much oxygen, fueling racism, the rise of anti-Semitism, Islamic phobia, right here in America. It's also intensified in the wake of recent events 
that led to the horrific threats and attacks that both shock us and break our hearts. On October 7th, terror attacks have triggered deep scars and terrible memories in the Jewish community. Today, Jewish families worried about being targeted in school, wearing symbols of their face walking down the street, or going out about their daily lives. And I know many of you in the Muslim American community, the Arab American community, the Palestinian American community, and so many others are outraged and hearty, saying to yourselves, here we go again with Islamophobia and distrust we saw after 9-11. Just last week, a mother was brutally stabbed. A little boy, here in the United States, a little boy who just turned six years old was murdered in their home outside of Chicago. His name was Wadiha, Wadiha, a proud American, a proud Palestinian American family. We can't stand by and stand silent when this happens. We must, without equivocation, denounce anti-Semitism. We must also, without equivocation, denounce Islamophobia. And to all you hurting, those of you hurting, I want you to know I see you. You belong. And I want to say this to you. You're all America. You're all America. This is in a moment, you know, in moments like these, when fear and suspicion, anger and rage run hard, that we have to work harder than ever to hold on to the values that make us who we are. We're a nation of religious freedom, freedom of expression. We all have a right to debate and disagree without fear of being targeted in schools or workplaces or in our communities. <clears throat> we must renounce violence and vitriol see each other not as enemies, but as fellow Americans. When I was in Israel yesterday, I uh, said that when America experienced the hell of 9-11, we felt enraged as well. While we sought and got justice, we made mistakes. So I cautioned the government of Israel not to be blinded by rage. And here in America, let us not forget who we are. We reject all forms, all forms of hate whether against Muslim, Jews, or anyone. That's what great nations do, and we are a great nation. On Ukraine, I'm asking Congress to make sure we can continue to send Ukraine the weapons they need to defend themselves and their country without interruption so Ukraine can stop Putin's brutality in Ukraine. They are succeeding. When Putin invaded Ukraine, he thought he would take Kyiv and all of Ukraine in a matter of days. Well, over a year later, Putin has failed, and he continues to fail. Kyiv still stands because of the bravery of the Ukrainian people. Ukraine has regained more than 50 percent of the territory Russian troops once occupied, backed by U.S.-led coalition of more than 50 countries around the world, all doing its part to support Kyiv. What would happen if we walked away? We are the essential nation. Meanwhile, Putin has turned to Iran and North Korea to buy attack drones and ammunition to terrorize Ukrainian cities and people. From the outset, I've said, I will not send American troops to fight in Ukraine. All Ukraine is asking for is help for the weapons, munitions, the capacity, the capability to push invading Russian forces off their land and the air defense system to shoot down Russian missiles before they destroy Ukrainian cities. Let me be clear about something. We send Ukrainian equipment sitting in our stockpiles. And when we use the money allocated by Congress, we use it to replenish our own stores, our own stockpiles, with new equipment. Equipment that, def that defends America and is made in America. Patriot missiles for air defense batteries, made in Arizona. Artillery shells manufactured in 12 states across the country, in Pennsylvania, Ohio, Texas and so much more. You know, just as in World War II, today patriotic American workers are building the arsenal of democracy and serving the cause of freedom. Let me close with this. Earlier this year, I boarded Air Force One for a secret flight to Poland. There I boarded a train with blacked out windows for a 10-hour ride each way to Kyiv to stand with the people of Ukraine ahead of the one-year anniversary of their brave fight against Putin. And I'm told I was the first American to enter a war zone not controlled by the United States military since President Lincoln. With me 
was just a small group of security personnel and a few advisors. But when I exited that train and met Zelensky, President Zelensky, I didn't feel alone. I was bringing with me the idea of America, the promise of America, to the people who are today fighting for the same things we fought for 250 years ago, freedom, independence, self-determination. And as I walked through Kyiv with President Zelensky, with air raid sirens sounding in the distance, I felt something I've always believed, more strongly than ever before. America is a beacon to the world, still, still. Whereas my friend Madeleine Albright said, the indispensable nation. Tonight, there are innocent people all over the world who hope because of us, who believe in a better life because of us, who are desperate not to be forgotten by us and are waiting for us. But time is of the essence. I know we have our divisions at home. <clears throat> we have to get past them. We can't let petty, partisan, angry politics get in the way of our responsibilities as a great nation. We cannot and will not let terrorists like Hamas and tyrants like Putin win. I refuse to let that happen. In moments like these, we have to remind, we have to remember who we are. We are the United States of America. The United States of America. And there is nothing, nothing beyond our capacity if we do it together. My fellow Americans, thank you for your time. May God bless you all, and may God protect our troops. President Biden in a rare Oval Office address less than 24 hours after his visit here to Tel Aviv, going before the cameras tonight, making a big ask of support, putting money behind what he promised here yesterday, and that was to stand with Israel. Also, talking about Ukraine, continued funding there, again, making a big ask. Let's bring in our chief White House correspondent, Peter Alexander. Uh, Peter, there has to be some political risk with this. Lester, I think that's exactly right for the president right now, who effectively is watching two separate war zones in the world, both of which he has little control over the outcome of these wars. The potential for either of them to spiral is really a real challenge he faces right now. The key takeaway, though, from his remarks tonight is that it is America's obligation and it is in America's national interest, national security interest, to help both Ukraine and Israel wait for him tomorrow to send an effort, a proposal for $100 billion in additional funding to help support those efforts in both countries. Lester. Peter Alexander, thanks. Our chief foreign correspondent, Richard Engel, has been covering this on the ground in Israel and joins me now. Richard, this is going to take a lot of global support. Does the president have that? It's very different in Ukraine as it is in, here in Israel. Uh, in Ukraine, there is generally universal support among NATO. Uh, the United States leads NATO, but it is one of many nations that feel very clearly that Russia and Vladimir Putin must be stopped. In the Middle East, it's much more murky. Uh, a lot of uh, America's Arab allies do not agree that the United States should be giving a carte blanche to Israel. They're we're very worried what will happen if in the coming days uh, Israel launches a ground offensive into uh, into Gaza, concerned that the U.S. could get involved in that war. All right, Richard Engel, thank you. This concludes our NBC News special report. Coverage continues on our streaming channel, NBC News Now, and online at NBCNews.com. And for those of you in the West, more coming up shortly on NBC Nightly News. I'm Lester Holt reporting from Tel Aviv. Good night. Good evening, I'm Jake Ward in for Gotti Schwartz, and as Lester Hall just mentioned, we were watching President Biden give a rare primetime Oval Office address to the country, where he seemed to be working hard to explain to the American people just what's at stake when it comes to wars in both Ukraine and Israel. Take a listen. As president, there is no higher priority for me than the safety of Americans held hostage. The terrorist group Hamas unleashed pure, unadulterated evil in the world. But sadly, the Jewish people know perhaps better than anyone that there is no limit to the depravity of people when they want to inflict pain on others. <clears throat> In Israel, I saw people who are strong, determined, resilient, and also angry, in shock, and in deep, deep pain. I also spoke with President Abbas, the Palestinian Authority, and reiterated that the United States remains committed to the Palestinian people, 
its right to dignity and to self-determination. The actions of Hamas terrorists don't take that right away. I know these conflicts can seem far away. And it's natural to ask, why does this matter to America? So let me share with you why making sure Israel and Ukraine succeed is vital for America's national security. Let's now bring in NBC's chief international correspondent, Keir Simmons. Keir, it's great to see you. This address comes right on the heels of Biden's trip to Tel Aviv. He obviously went out of his way to yeah. make his steadfast support for that country as clear as he could. How do you think it will be received in Israel in the morning? I think it will be received well in Israel because Israelis are already grateful and largely pleased with the way President Biden has reacted since those terrible attacks uh, more than two week, more than a week ago now. Um, I think what's notable about his address to the American people tonight, because it was also an address to the world, because people around the world will be watching, and particularly in the Arab world, Jacob, I think it was notable that he went out of his way to talk about Islamophobia mm -hmm. as well as anti-Semitism. That will, I mean, remember, it's the middle of the night um, here in London where I am, and into the Middle East, it's even more uh, in the early hours of the morning. So people will be waking up to hear what the president had to say. And they will be, his message will be played on uh, Arabic news channels. And I suspect, particularly in the countries that are America's partners and allies in, in, in the Gulf, uh, particularly, uh, that kind of message will be replayed. Uh, in the end, though, one of the challenges for President Biden is, of course, he talks about the right to self-determination. But it, one of the issues is, is how one person, how does one community get self-determination and another community get self-determination? Mm. In a sense, that's one of the difficulties that you're seeing uh, both in uh, Israel and also uh, in Ukraine, but in different ways. He talked about the fight against terrorists and tyrants trying to put together President Putin uh, and Hamas. Uh, and, and it was a convincing argument, but I'm not sure that everybody will be convinced that the two yeah. are completely connected. Well, Keir, you know, this is, of course, also coming as we got news of a State Department official resigning. He wrote, the Biden administration's blind support for one side, and of course he means Israel, was destructive. And he also added, I fear we are repeating the same mistakes we have made these past decades, and I decline to be a part of it for longer. I'm curious, you know, how you feel the, the president's steadfast support of Israel will be received by Arab leaders. I couldn't help but note uh, many times he referred to the idea of building a better Middle East and the infrastructure projects that he and the United yeah. States are involved in. All of that, of course, may fall on Israeli ears one way, but I would imagine might fall on the ears of Arab leaders in a very different way. Yeah, of course. Uh, you know, and I think how you build a better e Middle East is the is the problem. The, the idea, the aspiration is easy. Uh, and, and that's the, where we are right now. We're, we're really, um, in many ways, in, at an idea in, in the Middle East in terms of trying to build a better, be better Middle East. Uh, the, the idea, for example, that the U.S. has been committed to for a long time, the, the two-state solution, where you have Jews and Palestinians living side by side, um, in uh, in the Middle East, in, in Israel. Well, th th that is an aspiration, really, now, isn't it? More than something that seems achievable at this point. Yeah. And so all of those, all of that real politic will come crashing back in very, very quickly. Uh, I mean, again, just, just remember here that one of the purposes of the president's speech was to persuade the American people that it was worth spending more American dollars in, 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 in attacking these problems, if you right. like, in supporting the Ukrainians in Ukraine and in, in trying to figure out how to support um, the Israelis and also how to get help uh, to the Palestinians. And I mean, that is a, a, a laudable aspiration, of course, uh, because uh, to walk away from all of these problems, he effectively was saying, well, then you'll end up with the problems on America's doorstep. And mm. most many, many foreign policy analysts would say that's absolutely, absolutely the case, that a, that a fire around the world ends up uh, burning all the way to the American American uh, border. So it, it, it is it is a difficult argument for the president to make, but it is the argument that he had to make in a very difficult world. And Keir, we, we saw protests erupt all over the Arab world after that deadly hospital blast in Gaza and, of course, after Biden's visit to Tel Aviv. And now we have mm -hmm. this speech. For Arab leaders, I'm curious whether you feel that the U.S. president is now going to be complicit in whatever happens in this conflict going forward. 
Well, that is an issue. Uh, we're looking. Uh, Richard Engel was talking just there, just a little moment before we, a moment before we uh, began to talk. You, you and I, uh, and um, uh, he was alluding to the fact that, of course, that we're waiting for the ground offensive to begin by the Israelis. And I think one of the issues for the White House is that um, the U.S. Is, is, isn't telling Israel what to do, but it potentially will be blamed for what Israel does. So that's one aspect of this, because if there is a ground offence, I think the, the hospital explosion, uh, with the questions over the responsibility for that, and President Biden was clear in his speech tonight uh, that it was not the Israelis, uh, the, that, that explosion, frankly, is a taste of, what, of the kinds of anger that you might see if there is an Israeli ground offensive, because Gaza is such a packed place, so packed with civilians, that it's incredibly difficult to imagine how that's going to happen without civilian and casualties. Yeah. So all of that is is a prospect ahead. And I think in terms of you ask, you know, Jacob, about the uh, Arab world, I, I think the, the crucial point to make here is that um, even since the Abraham Accords, which were which are these uh, this deal that was done under President Trump that allowed for better relations between Arab, the Arab countries and, and Israel, even since then, uh, the Arab world's view of Israel, the Arab street, as it's called, has barely changed, maybe by one or two percent. Uh, so that that Arab street is is one of the challenges that leaders there really know that they face. They remember the Arab Spring when there were revolutions and uprisings. Those are the kinds of things that leaders in the region are really worrying about. And I think that's one of the reasons why you saw uh, President Biden's summit in Jordan cancelled by Arab leaders, because yeah. they didn't feel that they could stand there next to, to President uh, Biden and at the same time deliver the message to their people that they th think would applicate their people, if you like. So right. these, this, is a, this is an incredibly dangerous moment uh, because we haven't even talked about Iran and, and the militant organizations that Iran supports in the region. And we will get to those topics later in the hour. Keir Simmons, we thank you so much for the global perspective from London. Keir, thank you. Let's bring in NBC senior Washington correspondent Hallie Jackson to break down for us how this speech might be received here at home. Hallie, give us uh, the takeaway. What were some of the biggest for you uh, coming out of this address? Yeah, I think you and Kier have gone through, I think, some of what might resonate internationally here beyond our borders. But here at home, I mean, listen, this was the president making a muscular case as the the United States, as America being the, in many ways, defender um, of democracy. He framed it as the fight for protecting some of these democratic countries against threats that they face, whether it be Hamas, whether it be the threat from the Kremlin in the case of Ukraine. You heard the president casting it in those kinds of uh, almost existential terms here. It was a personal speech for him. And we have seen him take this personal tone before, Jake, especially, I mean, in the last 13 days since this war began, since that Hamas terror attack back on October 7th, the president has cast this in an intensely personal way. He talked about his visit to Israel, being there and seeing the pain and the grief that some of those people are going through. He talked about that horrific stabbing of that little boy, just six years old here in this country, because police say of straight up Islamophobia here. I mean, that is the, the, the way that the president framed this, saying there is no room room in this country for anti-Semitism. There is no room in this country for Islamophobia, essentially challenging Americans to like raise the bar on that front. And then there's the piece of this that I think is um, is what some people inside the beltway where I am here in Washington are talking about, which is the president making the case for why the U.S. must support our allies, in his view, Israel and Ukraine in the wars that they face here and continue to fund them, continue to send them money, continue yeah. to give them the aid that they need to be able to try to be successful here. Well, Hallie, let me ask you about that part. I mean, Biden is talking here about how he will be asking Congress to pass funding for both Israel and Ukraine. That's right. Here's a little bit of what he said. That's why tomorrow I'm going to send to Congress an urgent budget request to fund America's national security needs, to support our critical partners, including Israel and Ukraine. Is a smart investment that's going to pay dividends for American security for generations. Help us keep American troops out of harm's way. Help us build a world that is safer, more peaceful, more prosperous for our children and grandchildren. Now, I don't want to drag you down the rabbit hole of the speaker fight, but, but how does he accomplish this specific thing without a speaker in place? I mean, what can the president do without Congress? Nothing. 
financially as it relates to sending money overseas, Jake? What can the president do? He can't do anything. He can't accomplish it. And it's not him, right? It's the fact that there is not a Speaker of the House right now, meaning that there's not going to be a dollar that goes towards new aid here that can get passed because there is not a functional House of Representatives in this Congress to actually pass it. So, um, you, you know, we, we, there is some rabbit hole element to this because of how weedsy it can get when we talk about the Speaker fight and the Speaker drama. But it is critical at this moment because we know late tonight we are learning that the temporary Speaker of the House, the person who's been put in charge in just this caretaker role, just temporarily, is being very clear. He is not even going to try mm. to do anything more than simply gavel in, gavel out, get a speaker elected, because he believes Patrick McHenry, the temporary speaker is, the speaker pro tem, he believes that that is all he's empowered to do. Right? That, that is what the, what the rules and the limitations are in this moment, that right now the only thing the you see him there, the only thing the House of Representatives can do is elect a speaker of the House. Let me tell you, they are not close to that at this point. Mm. It looks like the next vote is going to be tomorrow morning. It does does appear that Congressman uh, Republican Jim Jordan is going to try for the third time to get enough Republican support, that all important 217 votes just about to, to get the speaker's gavel. He, he isn't there based on the numbers that we're seeing and based on the reporting that our teams are doing. So what is going to be different yeah. here in the speaker drama? Like, we don't know, potentially nothing. But the reason why it matters when it comes to what we're talking about here and this international crisis, this war in the Middle East, is because if if, and by the way, of course, the, the war that Russia is waging in Ukraine, it's just tough to see. I mean, it's impossible to have some of this money get passed when there is not a functional second chamber in Congress to be able to do it, Jane. Right. It all looks like political theater until some real stakes come right home here for us. So, you know, Holly, recent CNBC polling shows that some 60 percent of Americans disapprove of the president's handling of foreign yeah. policy, while 31 percent approve. And, you know, his overall approval rating is not looking too good either. Do you think this speech does him any good? How will all of this translate going into 2024, do you think? I think it's hard to say based on a speech here or a speech there. Obviously, it is significant that the, any president sits at that desk in the Oval Office, at the Resolute Desk, and gives remarks like that. It is rare. We see that just a a, ha a bare handful of times, right, in any given administration. It is not something that is used commonly. And it is a signal that this administration, whatever administration it is, is taking the issue seriously and has a message to deliver to people in prime time. That president believes very clearly, and, and you've seen it from what we've heard from White House officials, believes that this moment meets that, that this is a time when Americans, when people need to be tuning in, paying attention, understanding the stakes of these two different wars, and again, casting this as both Israel and Ukraine, and the fight against um, what the president sees is this existential threat to their democratic operations here. So there's, I mean, that is sort of the moment that we're talking about and the mm -hmm. moment that you've seen the optics of it, if you will, in this space. You look at some of the numbers of where the president is, as you mentioned, in the, in the low 30s, I think it was for the foreign policy approval, uh, low 30s overall, one of the lowest points of his presidency for overall approval. We are headed into a campaign year, um, and that is going to be like, this is, you know, we know that most American voters tend to go to the polls, they think the most important issues to them are often domestic, right? It's economic issues, it's pocketbook issues, it's kitchen table stuff. Um, but the way that any president handles a critical international moment obviously is significant. That said, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of factors that come into play when Americans go to the polls just about over a year from now, Jake. Yeah, Hallie Jackson with important perspective for us. Thank you so much for being here. And you've heard Hallie talk about the domestic reaction. You heard Keir Simmons talk about the global reaction. We're going to take you live to Israel next for more reaction there to the president's comments and show you what's happening there ahead of a possible Israeli ground invasion into Gaza. Please stay with us. I secured an agreement for the first shipment of humanitarian assistance from the United Nations to Palestinian civilians in Gaza. Hamas does not divert or steal this shipment. These shipments, we're going to provide an opening for sustained delivery of life-saving humanitarian assistance for the Palestinians. That was President Biden moments ago from the Oval Office reaffirming his commitment to address the humanitarian crisis in Gaza ahead of a possible ground operation. NBC's Josh Letterman joins us now from Tel Aviv. Josh, you have been covering efforts to get aid to Gaza. What is your initial reaction to President Biden's speech tonight? 
Well, there are a few points the president made that I think are really going to resonate tomorrow morning when the Middle East wakes up uh, to the news of this speech, Jake. First of all, the president going farther in this Oval Office address than he ever has before uh, in attributing uh, this explosion at the hospital in Gaza to Palestinian militants. The president saying it was not Israel. And every time the president has addressed this in the past over the last 48 hours or so, there was a caveat or he left himself a little bit of wiggle room as more intelligence was coming in. But uh, based on the president's remarks tonight, it appears that the U.S. Uh, has a more definitive assessment than they did just 24 hours ago when he was still leaving the door open to uh, a changing or evolving assessment. The president also, in these remarks, he did talk about pro uh, Israel protecting civilians in the Gaza Strip uh, as best they can. That was his phrase. But notably, he did not call on Israel to have any kind of ceasefire. He did not urge Israel not to go into Gaza. There was no effort by President Biden to really uh, tie Israel's hands ahead of this expected uh, ground incursion. Uh, but he also had a really challenging task here in trying to take these two very divergent conflicts, the war in Ukraine uh, and the war in Gaza, and try to put them under one umbrella of one sort of unifying theory. And they're so different when you think of sort of the, the David and Goliath analysis here. You have, you know, Hamas, this, this militant group in this tiny little strip of land versus uh, a very strong Israeli military, uh, whereas in Ukraine you have a, a smaller country with a weaker military against this, you know, behemoth nation of Russia with one of the largest militaries uh, in the world. But the president trying to tell the American people that supporting Israel and supporting Ukraine are, are part and parcel uh, of the same set of values, arguing that just like with terrorists in the Gaza strip uh, if you allow dictators like Vladimir Putin to be unimpeded and to continue, they are simply going to take and take and take the president urging Americans uh, to support both financially uh, and uh, diplomatically efforts to stop both Hamas and President Putin in Russia. And Josh, the U.N. Is, is calling, of course, for a ceasefire to get aid into Gaza. You have been covering this part of it. You know, give us the logistics again. What is needed to get the crossing open and the aid through? Well, first of all, they need to do some repairs to that uh, Rafa border crossing that has been badly damaged from airstrikes uh, over the last two weeks or so. But really what is mostly needed is diplomatic agreement. You need mm. to get the Israelis and the Egyptians to both agree to open that border. And that has been a major problem over the last uh, week or so. There does appear to be some progress. We heard the U.N. Secretary General, who is on the ground now in Egypt, he met with President Sisi today, and he says he is there to witness the opportunity operations underway to reopen that border crossing. And so that is raising some hope that potentially it could open uh, very, very soon, uh, potentially with the U.N. acting as inspectors, sort of overseeing what is going in to try to provide some assurances to Israel, given that they are very concerned that Hamas is going to divert that aid uh, and take it for itself. But really, the urgency here cannot be overstated, Jake, because as soon as, as Israel goes in with this, this expected ground incursion, that is just going to make it far more difficult difficult for any kind of humanitarian aid to be crossing into the Gaza Strip. And of course, it's not at all clear how the United States will keep track of whether or not it is diverted by Hamas, as the president said, it right. would have to for this aid to continue. Josh Letterman for us in Tel Aviv. Josh, thanks so much. Now, let's bring in Ellison Barber, also in Tel Aviv. Ellison, great to see you. You were at the border today, as was Prime Minister Netanyahu, who met with his troops. Here is one of his top military leaders telling soldiers to be ready. Watch. There is no forgiveness for this thing, only total annihilation of Hamas organization, terror infrastructures, everything that has to do with terrorists and whoever sent them. It will take a week, it will take a month, it will take two months until we eliminate them. You are not alone in battle. He spoke there, Ellison, through a translator of total annihilation. What signs are you seeing of that scale of military operation at the border? Yeah, Jake, I mean, this is really the first time in more than a week that we haven't been at the Israel-Gaza border at this time in the evening. That area where he was talking to troops, we spent a lot of time there in the last week or so. And there has been just consistently this massive buildup of military equipment, military troops in that area. There are very few civilians still around those locations. For the most part, uh, the cities on the Israeli side, they have been evacuated. So there's this eerie quiet and then just this heavy, heavy presence of military forces, military equipment, be that tanks, uh, 
armored car armed personnel carriers, uh, truckloads carrying ammunition and other supplies to the border. All of it is there. Everything has been in place from everything that we have seen for days now for them to launch this ground assault into northern Gaza when they decide to make that call. On the Israeli side, for quite a while, they've been using language saying that the ground assault into Gaza was imminent. A couple of days ago, a spokesperson for the IDF backed off that just a little bit, saying everyone keeps talking about the ground offensive. It might look a little different than people expect. But then today we heard that from Israel's defense minister. You heard a portion of it. He also went on to tell those troops, you have seen Gaza from the outside. You will soon see it from the inside. So there's been this waiting game of when will it happen? We've heard uh, bombardments. We've heard artillery fired into Gaza from the Israel-Gaza border. We have seen a lot of airstrikes going in there. But this full ground assault, it hasn't happened yet. But that language we heard from the defense minister at the border today was incredibly strong in telling those troops and Prime Minister Netanyahu was also visiting troops along the border there, that this would be happening and to prepare for it to be a long fight. But as you heard him saying there, they plan to, and they've been very clear on this, they say their ultimate goal here is to make sure that Hamas can no longer operate in Gaza. They say that means militarily. They also say that means in terms of governing. They want to make sure, they say, that what happened on October 7th never happens again. There is this open question of if Israel is able to completely remove Hamas from from the Gaza Strip, what happens next? Who then steps in as leadership? Mm. Does Israel plan to go back to how it was before Hamas took over, back to in time before 2005 when Israeli forces physically occupied the Gaza Strip and there were also Israeli settlers there? When the prime minister at the time, Prime Minister Sharon, pulled out of Israel, they then created this blockade, or pulled out of Gaza, rather. The Israeli troops and Israeli forces then created this blockade around Gaza, but they haven't physically been inside Gaza since 2005 in any meaningful sense. And if Hamas is entirely gone, they were elected there in 2006, then who steps in? And that is still something that Israeli officials haven't said in terms of what that long-term plan is. They stop at saying the goal is to make sure Hamas has no power and does not operate inside of Gaza ever again. And Ellison, as the defense minister speaks of total annihilation and as you see growing signs of the capacity for tremendous violence uh, that could flow across the border, we know 350 Americans Americans have reached out to State Department uh, officials for help. What is the latest on efforts to evacuate them as they are stuck in Gaza? Yeah, I mean, initially when people were talking about getting humanitarian aid via the Rafa crossing into Gaza, there was supposed to be this exchange. That's what Secretary Antony Blinken had initially negotiated, where when they let aid in at the same time, they would let foreign nationals out. Right now, there is no caveat to the agreement to allow aid to go in to also allow foreign nationals to come out. People seem to just be in this holding pattern. They've been told, uh, those who have U.S. citizenship, to get as close to the Rafa crossing as they can in the event it opens and they can get out. But there's not a concrete plan for that at mm -hmm. this point. Officials who are familiar with the situation have told NBC News that they have, the State Department has received requests from 350 Palestinian Americans inside of Gaza to leave, as well as for 400 hundred family members to leave. But so far, we don't know if or when that will happen. Jake? More than 750 people connected to the United States with, with no clear sign of how they'll get out. Elson Barber in Tel Aviv for us. Elson, thank you so much. And the unrest is spilling over the border into Lebanon. The State Department telling Americans today to get out as soon as possible. We'll show you what's happening there. Plus, here in the U.S., college campuses are a place you can typically express your beliefs. But when it comes to the war, the backlash students are facing is becoming pretty fierce. That's all just ahead. Please stay tuned. Colleges and universities have long been a breeding ground for spirited discussions and debates on controversial issues. But speaking out on the Israeli-Hamas war is putting students in a tough position, especially when their opinions are scrutinized under the harsh glare of the digital spotlight. Opposing rallies at Columbia, a die-in at Harvard. The latest protests are part of a long tradition of free speech on campus. But some law students are now finding their words can affect their future. Law firm Winston & Straw announced they rescinded a job offer to a top NYU law student this month after blaming Israel for the violence on October 7th. And law firm Davis Polk pulled three more offered to Harvard students for signing a similar statement. 
Now, a tenured professor has written an op-ed for the Wall Street Journal entitled, Do Not Hire My Anti-Semitic Students. Free speech does not mean there's no consequences for free speech. Professor Stephen Solomon says he considers any justification of the Hamas attacks to be anti-Semitic hate speech. This is a professional setting. These are people who are to be trained as lawyers. Um, they should not be going out as lawyers if they're advocating the murder and justifying the murder of innocent people. One Berkeley student group mentioned in the op-ed characterized the October 7th attacks as resistance to apartheid. In a statement to NBC News, the group calls the article a smear that wrongly conflates activism with anti-Semitism. Some students unaffiliated with the group say they are concerned about the precedent. I think regardless of which side you support, I don't know that professors should be encouraging it to uh, dissuade you from potential employment. Professor Kenneth Stern runs Bard College's Center for the Study of Hate. When you start drawing lines of saying what speech is permitted and what speech isn't, that's a horrible thing in society in general. And these are academic institutions. These are academic institutions. The whole point of an academic institution is not to be the State Department. Tonight, a debate over free speech and whether a student's public stance on a controversial topic should cripple a career before it even begins. Things are becoming increasingly tense on Israel's northern border with Lebanon. Hezbollah claims it hit five different Israeli military positions today, an attack that comes a few days after the Iranian-backed group said they were, quote, fully ready to join the fighting. And as Israel prepares for dealing with a possible second front in this war, other countries are taking serious precautions to get their citizens out of Lebanon. Today, both the U.S. and Saudi Arabia are urging their citizens to leave the country, or at the very least, exercise caution until they can. NBC's Matt Bradley joins us now from Tyree, Lebanon. Uh, Matt, they are asking foreign nationals to get out of Lebanon. Is this a sign that we might see an all-out war between Hezbollah and Israel? It is a sign we might see an all-out war, but we've been seeing those signs for much of the past week. I, Jake, I got to tell you, if anything, this is more of a sign that insurance companies who are underwriting commercial flights are getting scared that the airport uh, here in Beirut might shut down. That is the real worry, because what we're hearing from the U.S. Embassy here in Beirut is to get out now while commercial flights are still available. And when I speak with people at the embassy, they're telling me, you know, this is standard guidance. What they don't want is for tons of people to show up at the U.S. Embassy and claim, I'm an American, get me out of here. And that is an understandable issue because the American Embassy here in Beirut simply doesn't have the capacity to handle thousands, you know, tens of thousands of Americans desperate to leave if the airport is closed. So that guidance is simply saying, as commercial jets, which we've seen from Lufthansa just a couple of days ago, might start to stop flying then you should start to make arrangements to leave before that happens. Certainly the people who make money assessing that risk are worth listening to here. Thinking back here, Matt, to the 2006 war between Hezbollah and Israel, that ended with a U.N. ceasefire and a lot of bloodshed. No clear winner there. Hezbollah showed their weapons capability at that point. How much more serious is a war with Hezbollah and Israel than a war might be with Hamas in Israel in terms of military might? Well, it depends on how much skin Hezbollah is willing to put into the game. And that's a question that a lot of people here are bandying about. We don't really know. That is a question that might be answered in Tehran, because, of course, Tehran is the main benefactor of Hezbollah, but also of Hamas. But one of the things that Hezbollah has, one of the main things that they have that Hamas doesn't, are guided missiles. And that's mm. something that we've seen them already using on the border behind me. Those guided missiles stand, you know, really are in contrast to Hamas's just rockets, which are quite weak. They don't carry much of a payload. They need a lot of accelerant, a lot of fuel, and they're very, very inaccurate. Compare that to the kind of modern weapons that Hezbollah is able to use, that they're able to get from Iran or buy on weapons markets illegally because people in Hezbollah, their militants, they're actually able to leave the country and travel around the world in a way that Hamas militants hemmed in by that blockade in the Gaza Strip simply aren't. Hezbollah has international connections. They have posts and ministerial positions here. They control ports and airports in Lebanon. They just have access to more weapons and more money from Iran. So that makes them so much more powerful. You mentioned that fight back in 2006. We've been reading a lot of intelligence estimates, and honestly, nobody knows except for Hezbollah themselves. But we've heard from Hezbollah operatives and, well, from Hezbollah parliamentarians. Just one recently, yesterday, was speaking uh, at a, a rally, excuse me, two days ago saying that they're so much more powerful than they were back in 2006. And mm -hmm. you can believe that. Israeli estimates put their power in terms of their payload at about 10 times what they had in 2006. So we are talking about a different Hezbollah than what we knew nearly 20 years ago.
And could Hezbollah, which, as you say, is growing ever stronger, you know, could the, that organization joining the war, do you think, have some sort of domino effect across the Arab world? Well, when we talk about Hezbollah and when we talk about Iran, we can talk about what Iranians would call and what a lot of people in this region would call an axis of resistance. And that means Hezbollah, Hamas, two militant groups, powerful groups that are backed by Iran, but also governments like Syria's Bashar al-Assad and militant groups like the Houthis in Yemen. Now, these are groups that are both opposed to Israel, but also to Sunni Gulf kingdoms like Saudi Arabia. So they are loosely joined together. They are kind of in allegiance with Iran. They are kind of allied with each other. Mm. But really, it's unclear exactly how they would behave in an open war situation, a region-wide war, because it hasn't happened yet. But if it does, we can expect that there will be pressure on one or more of them to have some sort of domino effect to join one or the other. Because if Hezbollah does join this war, it will likely be to support Hamas. So that would show that there is some sort of mutual support, some sort of alliance. Now, whether or not other groups, other nations would join in behind Hezbollah and Hamas, that's yet to be seen. A loose but very worrisome set of concerns for Israel. Matt Bradley for us in Lebanon time. Matt, thank you so much. Up next, if you're wondering if the House has a speaker, well, I hate to break it to you, it almost seems like they're going backwards. We're live from Capitol Hill with those details next. A back and forth day on Capitol Hill ended with Republicans still unable to pick a speaker. Hours after Congressman Jim Jordan said he would not seek a third vote to become Speaker of the House, well, he decided to seek a third vote to become Speaker of the House. Jordan began the day by saying he would pause his candidacy for the job and throw his support behind giving interim Speaker Congressman Patrick McHenry the power to temporarily lead the House. But... Jordan said that move angered many of his far-right supporters. Here's how he described the situation earlier today. We made the, we made the pitch to um, members on the resolution as a way to lower the temperature and get back to work. Uh, we decided that wasn't where we're going to go. I'm still running for speaker, and I plan to go to the floor uh, and get the votes and win this race. But I want to go talk with a, a few of my colleagues. Particularly, I want to talk with the 20 individuals who voted against me um, so that we can move forward and begin to work for the American people. Joining us now is NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles. Ryan, Jordan said he was not running. Now he says he's going to run a third time. What happened today? Break it down for us. Yeah, he was never officially out of the race, uh, Jake. He just decided to allow this possibility of Patrick McHenry taking on the responsibilities of the speaker on a temporary basis so that he could continue to build support to get the jo job long term. But there just wasn't enough support within the Republican conference to make that happen. The conservative hardliners that support his candidacy want him to plow through and try and win over the holdouts that aren't in support of his candidacy. But those holdouts don't appear uh, to be breaking at all. Jordan did meet with them behind closed doors late tonight. Many of them emerged and made it clear that he will never get their vote. Still, Jordan plans to try things once more on the floor uh, tomorrow at 10 a.m. This will be the third time he attempts to get the 217 votes necessary, but all signs at this point, Jake, point to him being unsuccessful yet again. I mean, is that is that the case? He just simply does not have any chance of winning over the 22 Republicans who voted against him in the next vote, you don't think? Well, covering the 118th Congress, Jake, I will say very specifically that there's an, always a chance, right? There's always a chance. You never know what could end up happening. But I, I would say that the, the, the odds are very unlikely, and, and in part because the margins are so small. He can only afford to lose four Republicans, and right now there are 22 uh, who voted against him publicly, and there are signs, if you talk to these 22, who believe that there are other Republicans who will join with them if the vote continues and Jordan is insistent on right. moving forward. The biggest problem we have here, though, Jake, is that, yeah, Jim Jordan can't get 217 votes, but there isn't anybody else that get, can get 217 votes. And that's part of the reason we're going on two weeks without a Speaker of the House. And one of the reasons that the Congress is completely paralyzed from moving forward. And 
doing really important things like yeah. funding the government, which there's a government shutdown looming, and also, uh, you know, perhaps taking up this big supplemental aid package that President Biden talked about in his primetime address. Tonight. Well, Ryan, right, in the, in the final seconds that we have here, I mean, what is the process by which anything can get done, considering that the president is preparing to ask for Israel and Ukraine funding, the government shutdown? I mean, is any, can anything move forward at this point without a speaker? And the short answer is no, Jake. I mean, there are some that believe that there is the power for Patrick McHenry in this temporary position without a vote to move this legislation forward. Uh, our NBC team is reporting today that McHenry has been insistent that if they attempt that, that he'll step down from the post. So there really isn't a mechanism to move legislation through the Congress at this point until a speaker is appointed. And I've got to be clear, I, you know, there's really no path forward at this point. I don't see how somehow they're going to come to some sort of resolution. Uh, it's as divided and divisive a Congress as we've ever seen. Uh, and there's really no hope that this is going to be resolved anytime soon. Ryan Nobles on the gridlock. And the word is gridlock in Washington. Ryan Nobles, thank you so much. That does it for us this evening. I'm Jake Ward in for Gotti Schwartz. I'll be here with you again tomorrow. And until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.